This is a conspiracy theory that I feel like is a little bit too embarrassing for mainstream conservatives to talk about too much. The basic idea is that, I mean, it says it right here. Um, basically, when COVID-19 happened at the World Economic Forum, by the way, the World Economic Forum, just to be clear, is is attended by powerful and relevant people, but the institution itself is not like the deep state or whatever. It's literally just a group of economic advisors, uh, uh, bureaucrats, um, like policy wonks, that kind of stuff, getting together and like going, uh, well, what if we uh, allocated 3% more to this? Oh, ooh, that would be efficient. Ooh. So like that, it wouldn't like... We're, we're, we're not, we're not talking about like, you know, a, a secret society. Not that, yeah, that's what, that's what, that's what they want you to think, of course. Um, so anyway, this guy is called Carl Schwab. Have you, you've probably seen the New World Order. Wait, hold on. Wait, could I find that? New World Order song. Could I, could I find that, that video? Anyway, absolute banger. Absolute banger. This is the uh, World Economic Forum conspiracy theory. I'm kind of not kidding. This video basically sums it up. Back when COVID-19 happened, uh, Carl Schwab and some others at the World Economic Pro uh, Forum proposed a Great Reset. Now, one thing that you need to know about the Great Reset is that it didn't happen. Because the idea for the Great Reset was, hey, everyone's staying at home, global trade has slowed down significantly, maybe we could use this as an opportunity to reshuffle some of our economic um, superstructures without it being super destructive. Um, but like, you know, it's basically, it's kind of, it would be basically like, there's a period of low traffic on a road. Hey, not many cars are driving over this. If we want to repave the road, this would be the time to do it. Now, to be clear, the people at the World Economic Forum are ghouls, all right? They are, uh, they are like neoliberal, um, and for that reason, to them, a Great Reset is a, a, a series of, um, sort of policies and, uh, economic restructuring plans that would ultimately serve the interests of the neoliberal order, which is, uh, you know, continued wealth accumulation. Um, yeah, Millet, uh, 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 of Argentina actually joined the World Economic Forum, which is incredibly funny, uh, because it's gonna, it's, it's made a lot of people on the far right mad, because a lot of Nazis like Millet, because they're like, oh yeah, he's like Pinochet, he's gonna drop people from helicopters, um, but what they're forgetting is that fascism in Latin America usually means making yourself utterly subservient to capital. Uh, and that's what the World Economic Forum is here for. So anyway, um, the Great Reset didn't happen. Uh, despite the fact that COVID is still endemic, uh, we didn't get any gigantic economic restructuring. We got a massive amount of wealth accumulation pushed up to the top. Uh, you, you know, like, like, like billions and billions, like funneled up to the ultra wealthy. Uh, but that wasn't like a great reset. That was just what was already happening, but faster. So we are at the crossroad. There are so many threats, so many risks. And if we don't get them under control, we risk a kind of explosive situation. This is also an AI or deep fake. Or is it? You can't tell, can you? You can't tell after, after all of the, uh, uh, high quality fakes we saw, you know? Of... Quite the lead into this Ben Shapiro video. Oh hi! Oh, Next oh, we're doing like a like a like a a, a a Vox style kind of like we're cool and hit. Look at him! Look at him! He's wearing like a, a little a, a little like sweater, and he's he's got like a war room behind him. The richest and most powerful people on earth will meet at an event in Davos, Switzerland, an event called the World Economic Forum, or WEF. The WEF looms large in the public imagination these days, viewed by some as a conspiratorial organization determined to control all of us. So what exactly- did, did, um, Okay, really quickly. When, when did Ben Shapiro start doing this kind of content? Is this, is this completely new? Bosh, please quit spreading Great Barrington Declaration propaganda about COVID. Hold on one second. Have you been annoying multiple times in my chat? Yes, you have. Take a break. White name. Your name's literally white name. This past year. Is he trying to like shift away from the debate bro format thing? I guess considering he doesn't do debates. Ah, same. Uh, it makes sense. Exactly is the WEF. Where did it come from? What does it represent? 
And are the so-called conspiracy theorists right? Look at that! Dude, they're trying, it's like a knockoff, fuck it. Dude, they're literally doing the like, what? Bro thinks he's Johnny Harris. Yeah, yeah, like, you can't do this with Ben Shapiro. It just makes him look washed up. The World Economic Forum was first established in 1971, led by a German engineer, economist, and professor with a master's from Harvard. His name was Klaus Schwab. Schwab was the originator of a theory of governance and markets he called stakeholder capital. If you if you have this uh, uh, phrenology, I feel like being, uh, you know, like a neoliberal ghoul who runs an economic forum is your only path in life, you know? This was, yeah, this was, this was, he was, he was trying to accumulate enough wealth at the top to buy a new chin. Capitalism, defined in opposition to shareholder capitalism. Shareholder capitalism was a term coined by economist Milton Friedman, suggesting that businesses ought to focus on returns to their investors. As Friedman argued, quote, businessmen believe that they are defending free enterprise when they declaim that business is not merely concerned with profit, but also with promoting desirable social ends. In fact, they are, or would be, if they or anyone else took them seriously, preaching pure and unadulterated socialism. Schwab argued that businesses ought Yeah, that that does that does indeed sound like a talking point that he would make. That is true. Uh, I, from what I know of the guy, that does that does sound like something he would say. Yeah, ought to promote just that answerability, not to the people who bought and owned their shares, but to the world at large. Schwab wrote, "Quote, dude, Ben Shapiro is so f incoherent. He's a fascist, but he pretends at being a libertarian. But he also pretends at being like an ANCAP. You know, like he he's he, the." The, there are so many, like, he will simultaneously argue that it's socialism to expect businesses to do g social good outside of profit seeking, but also make five million videos about how Bud Light or Disney or whatever uh, is evil and bad because they seek their own profits instead of, like, pushing back against the gender agenda, you know? Um, <clears throat> and none of it means anything. Real quote, by the way, in Friedman, Friedman's logic is consistent with his belief. I, I, I know about Milton Friedman's belief system. Don't worry. I'm fully aware. A company serves not only its shareholders, but all its stakeholders, employees, customers, suppliers, local communities, and society at large. This philosophy, of course, means that those who control corporations ought to act as philosopher kings, answerable to no one but their own perceptions of moral duty. What? As the leader of an organization, you should do things that benefit all the people in the organization, not just yourself and the shareholders. What? I, I, I was under the, okay. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, this particular argument is attractive to those who love the idea of top-down command and control. In 1970, people who like the idea of top-down command and control are the ones who believe that business owners should do well to their employees and not the ones who believe business owners should only do well to their shareholders. That's the... That's the argument we're making. He's trying so hard to fit that square peg into that round hole. Yeah, no kidding. When Schwab launched the WEF, it was called the European Management Symposium. By 1975, the European Management Forum had attracted 860 participants, including the CEOs and chairman of the largest European companies. To be clear, by the way, I'm not defending stakeholder capitalism or the World Economic Forum. I think this ideology is ghoulish. There is an ideology that seeks to liberate the working class, and it's called socialism. These neoliberal efforts to, like, uh, uh, you know, sort of like uh, impose a nicer, better capitalism have always been at best misguided and at worst actively malicious, a way of pulling people away from real solutions and towards milk toast reformist policies. Uh, the World Economic Forum doesn't preach socialism. It doesn't even preach any real social responsibility, I don't think. Uh, you know, it, it, it sort of like, it tempts people, I think, with like wonkish solutions to real problems that have to be solved through more um, <clears throat> active advocacy. The European Management Forum also entered into official cooperation with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. As the WEF website brags, quote, after just five years, the forum had gained acceptance at the highest levels of business and government. While not advocating policy or strategy, the forum had become a respected organization that served as a valuable platform for business, government, civil society, and other stakeholders. To Isn't this an improvement on the reformist level? In many cases, no. You know, you, there are plenty of examples of stuff like this actively being harmful, like the uh, World Bank and the IMF 
being institutions that seem like you could fit them into the, you know, into the category of, uh, you know, insufficient but still beneficial reformism. But in reality, they actually reify the systems that they uh, pretend to reform, you know? To confer and collaborate. In 1987, the European Management Forum changed its name to the World Economic Forum, the WEF. Today, the WEF hosts the most important people on Earth. These institutions are ghoulish, but do you want them to be more ghoulish? One smart feller, I promise you, the World Economic Forum is not making businesses less ghoulish. I, I promise you, you are free to look at the World Economic Forum and the way it functions and the kinds of people who attend it. Like, okay, Millet is currently attending the WEF, you know? Just contemplate. Uh, people, people have, for, for as long as human hierarchy has existed, which is basically forever, People have attempted to develop ideologies and systems of control that seek to legitimize that hierarchy uh, by creating a, 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 a pretense of necessity or of reform, you know? How then do we move forward in a world with such inequality without uh, the World Economic Forum to reassure us that no, no, the issue here is not capitalism. The issue here is, um, uh, uh, you know, we haven't done it right this time. Millet said he's going to the World Economic Forum to combat those socialists. Oh, oh, he's going there to, to do battle with the socialists. I see. Okay, okay, that's funny. Wait, I hope we get some good clips out of that. He could be lying. It's possible he's just looking to, um, uh, you know, brown nose a little bit, considering the situation Argentina's in. Would you say stakeholder capitalism is a form of social democracy? Not even. Social democracy has to be state-driven. Um, this is just like, what if we prop, like, what if we made business owners be extra super duper special nice, you know, material forces dictate capital accumulation, nothing else. Uh, and the material like, uh, incentives with regards to, uh, traditional business organization will always drive the wealth upwards. You know, every time reform has tried to tilt the wheel in a different direction, so that more good is done to people with less political power, inevitably the wealth flows to the people with the political power, uh, you know, every single time. The solution then is a restructuring of the political power, not just the wealth. We have business, of course, uh, as a very important audience, and we have politics, we have uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, partnerships with many governments around the world, and of course we have NGOs, uh, we have trade unions, we have all those different parts. Media, of course. Media, of course. Right? And when... It's because I've seen some good charity related stuff from this milieu, but you were right. Yeah, well, I mean, Bill Gates is known for his charity, but how much like systemically has been done there? Um, if anything, he's kind of like siphoned wealth and attention off of potential long term um, structural solutions to the, um, uh, you know, the, the diseases that he's combated important um, experts and scientists and academia. And those people gather to coordinate their activities in changing the world. The future is not just happening. The future is built by us, by a powerful community as you here in this room. We have the means to improve the states of the world. We'll get to more on the WEF in just one moment. I think I understand why Ben Shapiro is doing this. Um, for multiple times now, Ben Shapiro has gotten into tussles with people like Tucker Carlson uh, for being more neocon aligned than um, than Tucker or the other like more open fascists uh, on the right wing. And I think uh, that Ben Shapiro is trying to posture as being like, no, guys, I'm totally like an ultra far right fascist. It's communism for anything good to happen ever. Um, even though, like, I'm pretty sure that Ben Shapiro's detractors would accuse him of being the kind of person who would like the World Economic Forum. If all this makes you a little bit nervous about the future of finance, well, maybe you might want to think about investing a little bit in gold. In gold. The yes! Fantastic. Yep. Uh, perfect. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, there we go. Gold, you say? Gold continues to lose against inflation. Gold can play a role in diversifying your savings, and Birch Gold can help you create a well thought out and qualify birch gold has been the exclusive gold man you can get meant doomer conspiracy theorists are such uh an easy mark they are so susceptible to emotional appeals you know they are like unbelievably weak and stupid
authoritarian moment smart investors diverse wait are we are we now shilling the book the book and the gold claim your eligibility for a free signed copy of the authoritarian moment oh he's giving it away it's a gift that's socialism ben 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 smart investors diversify especially in the phase of top-down experts who want to restructure the american economy it turns out you might want to be a little bit safer than just leaving your future in their hands birch gold can help you out right there tech Yes, the fifth person who's asked. I saw the folding ideas video on gold. Ben to 98, 98, 98. Protect your savings today. So what is the broader WEF agenda? In June 2020, in the middle of the COVID-19 global crisis. What's with the gold pushing everywhere now? The right wing is banking more and more on like an apocalyptic view, vision of the future. And they're capitalizing on uh, uh, people's paranoia. In, in reality, of course, like gold is no more safe an investment during social collapse than anything else. If anything, you'd want to invest in like, I don't know, ammunition and food. Um, but, you know, it's the, the gold, the gold thing sells. So Schwab wrote a piece on the WF website. It was titled Now is the Time for a Great Reset. In it, he said, quote, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies from education to social contracts and working conditions. Every country from the United States to China must participate and every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. So notice that what's being described here has no policy power whatsoever. It is literally just um, a guy's blog post. Like this is literally like an op-ed where he's like, hey, hey, quick, everyone, while we're dealing with the COVID stuff, now is a great time for us to like restructure our, our, our economic, uh, you know, are, are, you know, all the supply lines and stuff. Yeah. It's not a conspiracy theory. I mean, you can see it right here. WEF Chief Executive Officer Klaus Schwab described three core components of the Great Reset, creating conditions for a stakeholder economy. Again, I don't care for this bullshit, you know. It's literally like, what if we created a system where the bourgeoisie are still in control, but, you know, uh, 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 the bourgeoisie are like nice and stuff. A theory of organizational management and business ethics that accounts for multiple constituencies impacted by business entities like employer, employees, suppliers, local communities, creditors, and others. There is no systemic way to have a business system where a company is controlled autocratically by the shareholders and by the CEO uh, in a top-down fashion, but also to have them be, quote, good to their suppliers, local communities, creditors, and others. This is just a bullshit feel-good, like, hippy-dippy, embroider some flowers on a pair of, like, acid wash jeans bullshit, okay? Um, it's a way of nicifying capitalism. You're, you're painting the boot uh, that comes down on you. Uh, again, if you want an actual system that does this, we have it. It's called socialism. At the very least, you could refer to it as like uh, social democracy, social democratic reform. At least that's a real thing. But this stakeholder theory bullshit is purely just a way of um, uh, trying to like uh, niceify capitalism. You know, I don't care for it. I don't believe in it. Yeah, I don't think it's a tremendous uh, a surprise that the term stakeholder capitalism in its current use was developed during the Cold War as a way of pitching more corporate responsibility in a time where being an open socialist could get you blacklisted, you know? Um, like, during during a time, uh, uh, like, he, socialism as a concept was around for more than a century before this, but, like, in the American 1960s, how do we come up, how do we come up with an idea for, you know, uh, businessmen not being huge pieces of shit that doesn't get you co-intel pro you know stakeholder theory succeeds in being becoming famous not only in business ethic business ethics fields it is used as one of the frameworks in corporate social responsibility methods i don't want corporations to be nice or charitable or whatever I want corporations to be run by workers, or I want the boot of the government on their neck. This is, it's, this is all like, it's all corpo speak. This is all, it's, it's, this is all like, uh, this is like you hire a consultant for half a million dollars an hour to talk uh, and give a PowerPoint presentation to your, your management about how you're going to be developing this new, okay, sorry, but anyway, yeah, the, uh, great reset. Building in a more resilient, equitable, and sustainable way, use, utilizing environmental, social, and governance metrics, harnessing the innovations of the fourth industrial revolution. 
In a speech introducing the initiative, International Monetary Fund Director Kristalina Georgieva listed three key aspects of a sustainable response to COVID-19. Green growth, smarter growth, and fairer growth. Wow. All right. We must build entirely new foundations for our economic and social systems. That great reset would require heavy-handed top-down power in pursuit of environmental redistributionism, which would require massive... Environmental redistributionism? Does he mean economic re... What? What does he mean by that? Social restructuring. As Schwab himself says, quote, It's hard to comprehend how the move toward environmental sustainability could take place without a concomitant move toward social sustainability. So, so like... This is the core of the anti-World Economic Forum conspiracy theories. Um, even in their own milquetoast neoliberal way, Carl Schwab and the other WF people uh, said, what if we did things slightly better than we are now? We will, however, have to deal with racism. And uh, a bunch of conservatives around the world heard that and screamed, no, we want to keep the racism. That really is it. Uh, the idea of social sustainability, in this case, meaning any kind of like uh, equitable economic management that's what they're opposing and of course why wouldn't they you know what carl schwab doesn't see because i'm smarter than him is that capitalism is a system is built on a lack of social sustainability economic inequality isn't just a consequence of capitalism it is capitalism you literally cannot have capitalism without economic inequality that's the point you know it's like it's like having a monarchy without hierarchy it's 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 fundamentally uh, it's you cannot separate them you can you can reduce the amount of inequality certainly you can but it is a fundamental component of it and economic inequality is almost always justified along racial ethnic or national lines for as long as we have had ethnic inequality uh which is as far as i know forever uh we have had systems that have attempted to redistribute resources along those lines and justify them with the ethnic logic you know so in America today, there is a massive racial wealth gap. Now, to understand why that gap exists would involve acknowledging the existence of racism. Ben Shapiro is a massive racist, and like all racists, he wants to pretend that racism doesn't exist, but if you keep pushing the subject, then we'll show you what racism looks like. So as long as economic inequality is tied up in racism, there isn't any way to like attack or unweave this uh, tangled... Uh, you know, Gordian's knot of, uh, you know, uh, cohabilitating bigotries without uh, something a little more substantial than what if we did capitalism nicer, you know? Keep in mind that there are so many things that you and I could be enjoying today as part of an American social welfare system, as part of American social democracy, that didn't happen because white people in power didn't want it to go to black people. There are so many reforms and provisions with regards to welfare, food stamps, health care, uh, that were specifically fought against because they would be provided to all people, including black people. This isn't a secret or a conspiracy theory. You can literally look back since the, uh, uh, to, to right after the civil rights, I mean, even before the civil rights movement, but especially after, there were so many attempts to make this country a better place that didn't happen because white racists did not want those good things to happen to all people, which would include non-white people. Um, and it still happens today. It still happens to this very same day, right now, even to this day. Um, the myth of the welfare queen, that Reagan era racist smear, the idea that like some fat black woman is eating it, uh, you know, living large, eating uh, lobsters every night uh, off the billions of dollars that she gets in welfare or whatever, while the common white working man is like barely scraping by in Appalachia, that bullshit, you know, that that influences policy today. Social sustainability is, of course, a euphemism for social engineering and the overthrow of market economies. That's why people like Greta Thunberg show up at Davos to pledge their lives to overthrowing capitalism. <laughs> um, I promise you the World Economic Forum does not want to overthrow capitalism, if only. What we refer to as normal is an extreme system. It is a system defined by colonialism, imperialism, oppression, and genocide by the sure. so-called global north. What the WEF isn't so clear about is that the Great Reset would involve great suffering, like a lot of suffering. Schwab and one of- Explain how, I I'm curious. Um, if, if the world was exactly like how the World Economic Forum proposed, it would probably be better than the world we live in today but not by a lot. And I think that we would sacrifice a lot in the process, a lot of potential benefits we'd be giving up, you know? Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, like, what the worsening were, were you know, what, what are we talking about here? 
One of his books quotes a Malaysian businessman and founder of the Global Institute for Tomorrow, named Chandra Nair, who explained, quote, I think the idea that by 2050, six billion Asians can or should aspire to live like Europeans and Americans through a consumption, resource-intense model is essentially a big lie. We can't deal with it through pious statements and market instruments, but with draconian rules. And those rules won't be provided by markets, but only by institutions of society. Call it the state. Lowered living. I don't know why he would describe his own proposed policies as draconian, but uh, yeah. Um, the modern, like, Western man, like in America or Western Europe or whatever, is insanely full. So yeah, it's probably true that, like, we can't have 10 billion people on Earth all eating hamburger uh, every single day, you know. We, we do have, like, finite... It, it is kind of crazy how, to conservatives, the idea of a finite world of resources actually is a conspiracy theory. Like, for all of human history, humans have had to, um have had to operate on some understanding of the limitations of nature. You can only hunt so much. You can only forage so much. Like, there are limits. You can only fish so much. Humans, for basically all time, understood this. And it is only this very, very, very modern post-industrial society that can literally just, like, pretend that's not a thing, you know? Like, it, it, like, like that's, that's very, very much a new thing. Yeah, and the funny thing is, the only systems that actually do provide limitless energy, like solar or wind or whatever, are the ones conservatives don't give a fuck about, you know? But they are obsessed not only with pretending that all resources are infinite, but also only in using the finite ones. Oh, sure, Archrave, but I don't think that means we didn't have an acknowledgement of the system. After all, if, if like, tribal villages would, like, forage everything nearby or like burn the woods because they don't care you know like they knew it would f them over the modern man especially in the west is so alienated from the ways in which their dinner you know meal what their, their food comes to them uh they can't even comprehend the idea of scarcity anymore you know i'm not saying that like indigenous people were all like druids one with the wind or whatever just that there is like a very fundamental brain damage Living standards enforced by government hand in glove with corporations. That's the message. Asian Case example, the uh, Easter Islanders chopping down all forced. Now, didn't they do that for like religious reasons? I, 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 people are trying to counterexample me. What I'm saying is fundamentally correct. The idea of pe the idea of people literally believing all resources are infinite. This is a modern thing. OK, like the the there the, it's there are you had to engage in like practices of sustainability at a level of of uh, consumption. And, and harvesting beforehand, because if you didn't, then these systems would fall apart within a matter of months. Like, they, there had to be some engagement with it. Uh, but nowadays, like, who, who do you know who works in the fishing industry, right? Like, maybe the people who work in these industries know, but it seems like the conservative party, you know, the, the, entire, uh, the entire right wing, like, operates on a political, a politically mandated belief that resources are infinite. North Africa used to have four. I am not arguing! <laughs> What dies? I am not uh, okay. You're you're all getting bans. You're all getting bans. I at no point did I say pre-modern civilizations did not have like issues with sustainability. I didn't say that. You think I said that, but I didn't say that. You're in. I hate all you. Oh my god. Oh my god. Get out of here. Come back tomorrow. Why? I literally. I literally said. All right. I don't think modern people literally believe resources are infinite. No, 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 no. Uh, no, you guys don't know how deep the rabbit hole goes. There are a lot of conservatives who literally do not think that fossil fuels are finite. There's a conspiracy theory that's gained popularity that the idea that the earth just produces oil. Because what they, because keep in mind, a lot of these people are religious nutjobs and they think that the earth was given to them by God. So the idea is if God exists, gave us the earth for its resources, and also uh, that God can do whatever, because it's God, you know, um, why would there be a finite amount of oil or coal? Like, they don't think that the amount of oil or coal in the earth is dictated by some, like, biological process 100 million years ago. They think it's a resource given to us by God that we could access once we had the ability to, you know? It took humanity a while to figure out how to use it. Uh, and now we, uh, 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 you know, and, 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 you know, and now, and now we can, and it's infinite, you know? It all comes from the ground. Infinite from the ground. There's like a big well of it, you know? And it's infinite. While it is true that organic matter gets transformed into oil or natural gas, that process takes forever and we're extracting it way too fast for it to replenish, I think. No, 
it will never be made again. My understanding is that it's either oil or coal, I forget which one, but the biological, like the compost composition of the layers of the earth, literally, it, there will never be any more again. Is it coal that I'm thinking of? Uh, it, like, it's done. I mean, we can wait 50 trillion years for a drop of oil more. Why? Because the time period that we're getting our coal from was a time period with much higher levels of oxygen and much more rich foliage. The world used to be blanketed in like megafauna, plants that stretched across the world. You know, the planet would have looked very green from space. And uh, that like era, uh, that like epoch of history, it just isn't the case anymore. And it probably never will be again because it was the product of like geological uh, forces, you know? Megaflora? Did I say megafauna? Well, I guess technically megafauna too, yeah, but megaflora is what I meant to say. It's actually slightly different. Don't care. <laughs> Not just that. Another important element is that the fungi of decomposition processes hadn't evolved yet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, 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 now the planet has uh, decomposition fungi or microorganisms or whatever that can break down stuff to keep it from turning into coal, but they didn't back then. So there, there will literally never be coal again, unless uh, not, not in a human time scale at least. So we're like, that's it. The coal that we found on the surface, that was it. That was the only coal on Earth's surface ever, forever. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope after the Great Reset, uh, humanity rediscovers solar panels because uh, <laughs> we're not getting fossil fuels a second time. You ever think about that? That if humanity kicks the bucket, but like some survivors make it through the other side, they're not getting fossil fuels. They can get hydroelectric, uh, you know, they can get uh, solar if they can figure it all out. They'll have to figure it out. Good luck. The rare earth minerals, we're not finding those anymore, you know, um, stuff like that. Uh, pretty difficult. There's always wood. Yeah, but you know, woods, you know, there's a reason we moved to coal. How are they going to make the choo-choo trains? So what you're saying is we should burn down the forest to make charcoal? Well, charcoal and coal aren't the same thing. But I mean, if you want to, I guess. For fun. Imagine being a human-like species on a planet without accessible coal, coal or oil and how much that would set back development. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, like, kind of pissing into the wind here. I don't know for sure. Nobody does. And I, but I, I am also, like, a dumbass, so who knows. My guess would be that even without access to rare earth minerals or to... Um, uh, 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 fossil fuels, we would still be able to eventually reach a decent level of technological development. There's some stuff I don't know if we'd ever figure out, like silicon computer chip. I mean, there, there are some, I, I feel like there are points where we might have difficulty, but as long as you have iron and wood, and we'll always have iron and wood, because iron is functionally limitless, the planet's made out of it, like it's not that hard to find iron, uh, even if, you know, it, it, you can find bacteria that have iron on the surface, that's what that, um, that uh that, that youtube channel does primitive technology coal is needed for advanced metalworking you you can get a uh, steel worker you can get steel furnaces hot enough with wood it's possible it's not easy and you need good insulation and a lot of wood but it's doable it would be a lot harder but it's doable how do we get that insulation uh oh no what, what am i a tech guy go find a youtube i'm sure there's like a youtube video on it you know you can vosh the problem is the cost you can't have skyscrapers under those conditions good. I hope the next civilization that rises up after this one just ditches that and everything gets to go back to what God intended for us. Three-story brick row houses, okay? Yes. Nothing on Earth should be taller than uh, the height limit in DC. You will eat the bugs. <laughs> yeah. DC is so pretty, man. Uh, everything in DC has the height limit. Um, somebody said it's not because of security. They said it's actually because of aesthetics. This is a this is a CG render. I don't know why, but it looks like this. Everything looks like this. It's all like five, five, six, seven stories tall. There, thereabouts. Um, but uh, it's like it, these, all of DC is like this. At least the the center part of DC that's near the White House and Capitol building and stuff. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, like this. Ain't that nice? I mean, you you would you, you can build up to this height without steel. Isn't DC super gay? Super gay. Yeah. Here's it from above. Look at that. That's some like classic European style city planning right there. You, can you can you imagine cities being designed by something other than what's next to the interstate highway that we're building it next to? Can you imagine? Can you fathom the idea of somebody saying this will be the town square? We will build a radial wheel out from it, and and it's and they just do it. 
There's the Washington Monument over there. Anyway, all we need to do for the entire world to look like this is for all of us to die out so the next civilization builds stuff like this out of brick and stone, you know? We don't need steel to get up this high. They used to build buildings this high, even without Gothic architecture and all the arches and stuff. We can do it. Drawing. Wait, hold on. Painting of Washington, D.C., downtown, 1800s. D.C. was a swamp for a long time, so I don't think they had much development back there. I guess I'd have to look at, like, New York. Why the f*** does Google say this is an 1800s oil painting and then show me a f trolley or tram or whatever right here? What, who are you fooling? Who, who, who are you trying to fool? 1800s, my ass. Didn't it need rebuilding after 1812? Well, I mean, the, the White House did. I don't know if the city, I don't know how much the city itself was damaged. AI, this is probably AI, yeah. Everything's AI now. Hopefully when we rebuild humanity, they don't find the rare earth minerals needed to produce AI. Governments need to reject the Western model. They need- There were trolleys in the 1800s? Uh, like when? The late 1800s? Come off it. 1800s doesn't mean 1892. Off. To move beyond the rhetoric of liberal democratic capitalist systems which say that individual rights are sa uh, sacrosanct. All of this will usher in what Schwab calls the fourth industrial revolution. It's like a person saying they're in their 20s um, when they're like 29 years old and less than one month from being 30. According to Schwab, this fourth industrial revolution will be all about integrating into a big data world driven by government and business. It will involve, quote, a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. One of the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. And that, of course, will require even more top-down design and control. So. What will this great This is a very insubstantial video. This this is re this is um reinforcing my belief that Ben Shapiro only made this video in a desperate effort to try to like rebrand himself after all of the shit um with Tucker Carlson, you know? This this video do does isn't even touching on anything. It's literally just like, "Hey guys, hey guys, I hate the deep state too. I hate the big parentheses deep state too, you know?" I'm Cuban. My family already went through this with Castro. Look how well that worked out. God damn. We need, like, a repatriation program for Gusanos or something, dude. Florida's f***ed because of them. Oh my god. All of the former slave owners. <laughs> I, I will abide and allow uh, a criticism of Castro, but anyone who pretends Castro is worse than Batista, right, you're going right back to Cuba, okay? We're, se we're sending you right back. You, you will drive the, the classic pastel car, okay? I don't know what it is about Cuba, but every single time I see photos in Cuba, I see, like, these adorable, like, pastel or colored cars or whatever, okay? You you will get, you will eat the bug, you will live in the pod, you will drive the classic car, okay? You're going right back, we're sending you, all right? Castro's ghost is dragging you down into the abyss. Bosch trolleys were in D.C. in 1862. I've already decided that you're wrong. I've already, de I I've already concluded that they aren't. I don't know what the f people are trying to get from this by being the 50th person in a row after I've already like verbally acknowledged that streetcars existed before 1900 to point out that they existed back then. After we're past that point, what are you, what are you doing? It reset this new revolution look like? Well, it could look like replacement of traditional food sources by, say, alternative protein sources like bugs. Uh, yeah, there we go. There we go. That's the eat the bugs. The Davos agenda for 2022 included an article explaining, quote, insects are an excellent alternative source of protein and significantly reduce our carbon footprint. How exciting. It could look like widespread neurotechnological brain enhancements, as Schwab suggests will happen. Or maybe it'll like Elon. Isn't that what Elon wants? That's what that's literally like Elon is a right wing darling. Streetcars have been found alongside dino fo dinosaur fossils, L. Yeah, streetcars actually make up the coal layer. Um, street streetcars degraded before we had the microorganisms to uh, process them, so they turned into coal uh, deep in the Earth's uh, crust. It'll just look like the end of private property ownership altogether. In 2016, the WEF released a video predicting that by 2030, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. This is, dude, this is such a surface, like, this is really boring, I'm not gonna lie. This is like... The, okay, notice how every talking point that has come up was in the f song that we looked at at the beginning. Literally, are you ready for the new world order? No more like all that. Like the all the talking points he's brought up in this stupid fake Vox format. Um, 
were brought up in that song. Like, it's so surface level. There's no engagement or what. You just bring, oh, here's a quote from 2016. Everyone knows this quote, you know? I don't even, I don't even want to, like, defend the World Economic Forum because I, I hate them. Uh, obviously, the World Economic Forum is preferable to the insane fascist conspiracy theories that people make about them. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to defend them, like, on the basis of the shit they've said. Just point out that people, like, lie about them. You know, I think the you'll own nothing and you'll be happy thing is a defense of the renter's economy where nobody like owns anything, but instead you pay a much smaller fee to rent it because it's more economically efficient or whatever. I'm not defending any of this bullshit. I, I don't like the World Economic Forum, but uh, fundamentally conservatives agree with this point. Conservatives are literally in favor of this line of logic. This, yeah, this is about subscription and rent and subscription and rent are beneficial to the bourgeois and landowners and uh republican economic policies have always massively favored those two groups the republicans have no issues whatsoever uh with 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 you know you'll own nothing and you'll be happy notice how one of the conservative counter arguments to economic inequality is that you own a refrigerator or that you own a microwave like no, notice how common it is for them to counter any uh, accusation of 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 injustice with like well you own something you know uh, they, they are not pro-ownership. That's not something they care about. The whole modern economy relies on, uh, it's a renter's economy, you know? False, they object to people being happy. That's true. The, the criticism of this quote is the happy part, not the YOLO nothing part, you know? For those of you who don't know, and there are like a bunch of really good books on this subject that I, and I suggest you take a look at them because they're interesting. Um, but like after World War II, there was a period of time during which the middle class in this country seemingly had everything that they wanted. Not actually, of course, but in terms of like providing basic material needs in between like the 1930s when we're recovering from the Great Depression and the 1950s after we were experiencing the post-war boom, uh, there was a there was a middle class and the middle class didn't really need a lot of the things that corporations wanted them to buy why do you need new furniture you have the furniture why do you need new appliances you have the appliances why do you need anything really you have the things you need so two ideas developed in parallel uh took root and began to uh ruin our lives one of which is the idea of planned obsolescence there are a lot of appliances made back in the 1950s that still work today as long as they're properly maintained nowadays you can buy a toaster and it just falls apart like nothing stays together you know a lot of that is because it's marginally cheaper to produce stuff that's lower quality but also because it's cheaper that means people don't feel as bad about purchasing more of it uh, if it breaks down. And once you sort of like socially normalize the idea that stuff just breaks, you know, people have to keep buying it, which means there's never a point where people like don't need a thing, you know? There's never a point where a family or a person or whatever will never need a thing, you know? Um, fuck, you know, they did that with cars too. This might be crazy to believe because there's actually been a reverse on this trend, but for a long while, uh, cars would fall apart after just a couple of years, you know? Uh, that wasn't that uncommon. Even luxury cars would turn into, you know, just like shitty rust buckets after a while. Um, because cars were manufactured, um, with the assumption that people would be keeping up with the rat race. So you wouldn't want to keep the same car for five years anyway, you know? You'd want to buy a new one, so why build a car that's meant to last longer? Thankfully, we've seen a bit of a reversal on that trend. Cars today are better made than they ever have been in human history. Um... So that's one thing. The second thing we normalize is the renter's economy, you know? And you can take a look at like the rise of the credit card, but when people have everything they need and there's no real such thing as credit, like before credit cards, you know, people didn't take out loans that often because taking out a loan meant going to the bank. Like if you wanted to buy something on credit, you would have to go to the bank and explain to a banker, like, I would like it if you could give me $500 so I could buy this thingy or whatever. Like, that's a lot of work. Now a credit card allows you to borrow whenever you want, and we know how credit cards work, but before credit cards existed, people were much more likely to live within their means because the amount of money you had was a literal, objective, finite thing, not the kind of like abstract, wishy-washy, like paycheck to paycheck, you owe this much in interest bullshit that we deal with today. Um, the idea of a renter's economy, one in which people could buy and spend more and also spend more on interest because, you know, the amount of money you had on hand at the moment was kind of like fluid and abstract, that developed more over time, you know? 
you know what I'm talking about, right? Can, can you understand, like, if you have an amount of money that is defined in finite literal terms by the cash in your wallet and your bank account, and you know how much is in that, you know what you're spending, right? And nowadays, that's still the case, right? You can still have cash in your wallet and you can have um, a bank account, but you want to spend on your credit card, don't you? After all, that's how you build credit. If you want to buy a car or a house in the future, you need to demonstrate you're capable of borrowing money and paying it back. Now banks won't trust you unless you run up a debt on a credit card and pay it off. So there's an incentive, a material incentive to use your credit card. Credit scores, a, an invention, not an infinite thing, not like an old thing, an invention designed to incentivize you to borrow more. And you want to borrow more, so you spend more, so you can't pay off off the principal, so you have to pay the interest, so you live forever in debt. Which is why, hold on, how many Americans have credit card debt? Nearly half of credit card holders carry debt month to month on at least one card, and 56 million card holders have been in debt for at least a year. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. That's the debtor's economy. That's the renter's economy. All of this was done by design. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't done as like, a, this wasn't just like an incidental consequence of a set of systems that would have happened anyway. This was a deliberate effort to push and incentivize certain types of transactions as a way of getting people to think of their current like cash availability as more abstract. So they have to pay the interest. So banks make more money. So corporations that sell commodities make more money because you buy more things because you have a wishy-washy amount of credit card money Blah. That's the exact limit of the knowledge I have in the subject. I'm sure there are some great books in the subject. And I know that because I remember a YouTuber recommending one once, but I don't remember the name. Okay. Do you think credit cards were a net negative? Absolutely. 100%. Yes, absolutely. The changes that were facilitated by the uh, availability of uh, the credit card and credit scores are like a, a, like a absolute, like 100% negative. Yeah. How many people have credit cards? Um, probably most every adult. You kind of want them because, again, if you don't run up debt and then pay it off, you don't build a credit score and you want that credit score for a variety of things. There's always been finance, Vosh. People would get everything on tab, then pay it off every year. It's not the same. I promise you it's not the same. Paying stuff off on tab or promissory notes or like being in debt on a loan are not the same as the credit economy. Now it's infiltrated every level of every transaction to the point where most people make most of their buys on credit cards. Like it's, I'm not saying that the concept of borrowing is new. I'm saying that like on a structural level, it, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's been completely infused into modern economic. Okay, here, we got a lot to do today. We're, we're off to a kick and start, you know? Big, big, big kick. Almost certainly, the new revolution will look like top-down social engineering by the big brains, all in the name of smoothing out the bumps of technological change. Regulators will work hand in glove with big- You can open a credit card, pay it off every month, and never have debt and build a credit score. Yeah, of course, I know, of course you can. I'm just describing the actual material consequence of what it, ha what it does. Like, yeah, you, you can be built different or have a lot of money and just pay off all the debt that you accrue in the credit card, for sure, yeah. ...business to work out the rules for your life. As Schwab writes, quote, governments and regulatory agencies will need to collaborate closely with business and civil society. Like they always have? <laughs> really, that's kind of self-explanatory there, I feel. Like, yeah, no shit. Notice that at no point in this proposed structure does either liberty or representative democracy really play a role. Why would, why would those things play a role in the quotes that you've selected from like a decade of shit? Why would you, like you're selecting quotes. What would you, you just chose to not select quotes that involve democracy. The World Economic Forum is pro-democracy ostensibly to the extent that capitalists can be. Um, it, this is literally like, I, I have taken a book uh, on 9-11 on and I have like quote I have like found this one segment where a guy describes his breakfast the morning of 9-11, and I only quote the breakfast description of the pancakes. And it's like, why did you not mention 9-11 in this book, you know? That's because liberty might suggest the irrelevance of the honchos at the WEF. It might suggest that they themselves are the obstructive force in the way of human happiness. This is so late. This is this is this is pretty lazy. This is so this is desperate. This was made in like a week. Maybe not even a week. This is a very unconvincing effort, you know? I remember the early aughts with ads like this uh, by Citibank trying to push credit cards onto people with the slogan, live richly. Remember, miser is only four letters shy of miserly. City, live richly. Yep. 
Yeah, they it, 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 it's crazy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, Shroomery. Have you noticed now how anytime you buy anything anywhere, even the um, website itself gives you the option to pay in installations? Like, you can buy a $20 thing off Amazon. They're like, or you can pay for $5 four weeks. This is getting people to buy outside of their means. Maybe you don't have $20, but you do have five. So you just need five next week and you cover it. Like everything is about making, make the commodities worse, convince you to spend money that you don't have, get you in debt. That's it. Oh, by the way, if you can't pay off the later installations of those uh, free monthly install, you know, those like free payments, or whatever, no interest. If you can't pay off the latter portions of it, oh boy, you are in for it, buddy. You're in for it. Uh, you, you've fallen for the trap, mother You thought you could buy a thing when not having the amount of money to pay it off in full? Oh, you, oh, you stupid piece of shit. Not gonna lie, I have a lot of credit card debt now, and an orange name. Hmm, curious. Shapiro really lost his edge, dude's content is just lazy. Well, like I said, there's no real interest in talking about this subject. This is just meant to, like, signal to his viewers that he's woke on the JQ, like Tucker Carlson. And representative democracy is too messy and slow for the fast-changing world the WEF wants. You need regulators working with business to change the rules at a moment's notice. The only that 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 is what regulators do. Yeah, regulators don't typically like wait on congressional bills. That's how regulators do stuff. They yeah, you would want them to act quickly, as opposed to like acting slowly. Yeah. Solution according to the WEF is the very important people at the WEF working in the name of a vague general will that never requires the WEF doesn't pretend to want to be the head of the organizations they're talking about like the World Economic Forum says they think changes should happen they're not suggesting that they like replace democracy and be put in charge of some kind of like massive regulatory body there's actual accountability to anyone if all of this sounds frightening that's because it is the arrogance of a business and governmental elite seeking to control all of us is absolutely breathtaking. The policies discussed at Davos shaped the elite caste in nearly all Western countries. When you hear about the end of carbon-based fossil fuels or global tax regimes or corporate governmental cooperation, a lot of that is coming from Davos and the World Economic Forum. When people talk about the globalists, the folks they most often mean are people like Klaus Schwab. And when those globalists get together at Davos, understand the ideas that they are discussing will have real world effects on you your business, your church, and your family. Hold on, in summary. Drop it, everyone. Okay, wait, from the drop onward. I really, I really like the, the article they put here, which is the most frightening thing imaginable for an American. This means people in the developed world eating no more than two burgers per person per week. Oh no, dude. This is, it's a horrifying to an American, you know? It's, 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 it's unimaginable. I hate that nobody accepts cash anymore. It's hard currency. Yeah, the only time I ever have any cash on hand is after visiting a dispensary. And I don't even smoke weed, so I don't visit a dispensary that often. It's when I'm buying for friends. So I feel bad now because whenever I pass by homeless people, I have literally nothing to give them. I, 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 I love like exiting a fashion boutique, still holding my designer wallet and like tucking it in my pocket and then walking by a homeless person as they ask me for something. And I am and I sincerely and authentically say, I don't have anything. I'm sorry. I love that feeling. I need to take some cash out, man, like keep some 20s in the wallet or something. Who doesn't take cash? Uh, a lot of places don't. Well, a lot of places also don't want to take card. It, it varies. It depends on the area, and, you know, the business. Just give them a sub lull. Yeah, that's true. By the way, the buy now, pay later economy is one of the largest forms of debt in the States, especially among younger people, given the current bleak outlook and the fact that most will never own anything. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, I do for what it's worth, by the way, and I'm going to sound very like neoliberal for a moment. I do think that like in terms of with the exception of rent and medical costs and stuff like that, stuff is cheaper than it ever has been. And I do think that if you want to be like a gigabrained, high IQ uh, master of your own fate, 
it is possible to skill issue the debt economy just by not buying shit. Um, the problem is, is that like all of these systems are designed to bait you into spending money. You know, you can't go outside or hang out without spending money. Uh, here, you can have a bunch of cool shit. You can buy it like on a credit card. It's no big deal, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you can get it like no APR, like uh, payout over four weeks, whatever. There's a bunch of like, the, it's designed to make you make bad decisions. And at the end of the day, like the purpose of a system is its outcome. If they make you make bad decisions, that's the purpose of the system. So, um, you know, I do think that a person with a lot of discipline and will could probably do pretty good saving up in this economy, not for stuff like rent, housing prices or whatever. But I do see a lot of people who are my age or younger who cannot spend money responsibly for shit. And I'm reminded of the fact that for a very long time, like the average person could buy like one new thing a month, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe. Uh, and, and people would cycle through two or three outfits like that was the case up until very recently up until like the 1960s uh, People would only have like a couple of outfits, you know You'd have some shirts or whatever, but for the most part like you that's that's why people took such good care of their clothes But now everyone like throws it away or whatever. I, I think it's possible to skill issue it to an extent Should we advocate for credit card abolition? Oh, oh yeah, unironically. Yeah fully. Yeah, I, I think that would be good I think that'd be far better businesses wouldn't like that though. Are you telling Millennials to not buy avocado toast? I mean, to an extent, a little bit. I don't think that's the cause of the current economic inequality. If it was just down to bad decision making, there's nothing like, there's nothing wrong with the brains of millennials that wasn't wrong with the brains of boomers. So there's a reason why so much wealth is in the hand of boomers and not in the hands of millennials. And it's not just like, oh, I guess this generation's just dumb. The systems are different and the systems incentivize bad decision making. So it's harder and harder to skill issue your way through it, you know? And it's not, and dude, who am I to talk? This is what I mean by the hypocrisy of the wealthy, because I get to make bad financial decisions now. Back when I was in college, I didn't, but now I do, you know? Middle-class people look down on poor people for making bad economic decisions, when in reality, both of them make the same amount. In fact, the poor person might make less. The difference is a middle-class person can ride out the decision. A poor person's life can be ruined by it. So I can be like, don't buy your avocado toast. I bought an $8 coffee the other day. This shirt was $70. I can do whatever the fuck I want. It's not a matter of me being more responsible than you guys. I didn't skill issue my way out of anything. I'm just a live streamer, you know? Like, I just did well uh, by, by virtue of uh, debate lording or whatever, you know? So, I'm, so that doesn't, like, negate the fact that if you are skilling your way through it, I think you can actually do decently well in some ways. I'm just saying that's not a fair ask. Basically, what I'm saying is if you're willing to be more responsible and disciplined than humans generally are and have been, you might be able to make it. Does that make sense? Like, does that like I, I, this isn't like a I'm not saying that the it's like a skill issue, but you're on a much more difficult gauntlet uh, than the boomers were, you know? Yeah, you can you you can skill your way through a rigged game. What a childish take from what a childish take bot. Oh, good thing I saw the name. That would have gotten me.